And I've never really been a gear junkie. Same kind of thing for me. Like I like to just use the stuff that works. And I look at like, if it's not causing me any issues, then I'm not going to go out there and spend an extra few hundred dollars just because it's got this logo on it. Um, and I like, honestly, like a lot of the stuff, uh, just for like, uh, like the little like knickknacks that you have when you're taking everything out in the woods or how you're tying things together. Like I feel that I've developed my own hunting style that it's so hard for these big businesses to break down how all these people are hunting. And I like to just like customize a lot of my stuff anyway. And uh, like, I don't, I don't get big into a lot of like the camo and everything like that. Like I feel that, you can get around that by just understanding the wind and thermals and approaching the woods the right way. And as from the gear standpoint, same kind of thing. Like if it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is the aptitude outdoors podcast where we interview conservationists, hunters, anglers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the greatest stories, information, and advice from the best in the world. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Thanks for tuning back in. Today, our special guest is Greg Kazmierski of Whitetail Partners. We learn about deer management, how you can manage your land to produce more, bigger, better deer. You know, Greg's journey, how he got into hunting and where he's at now with really targeting big buck species and why he's okay with not getting deer every season and a lot more. Hope you guys are ready for an awesome episode, but first, a quick word from our sponsors. I'm a huge fanatic for handmade, high-quality leather and canvas products. In my opinion, they last longer, hold up better to the abuses of travel, and honestly, they just look really cool. That's why I use Badger Claw Outfitters. They've been making handcrafted products for hunting, camping, and travel since 2011, and that's right up my alley. The best part is they're made right here in the USA and are guaranteed for life. They've got everything from gun leather, belts, custom knife sheaths, wallets, duffel bags, leather and canvas pouches, everyday carry items, and more. Badger Claw Outfitters, made in the USA, built for the wild. Managing for whitetail is like a big deal all over the country, and Ohio has some like pretty big deer you know compared to a lot of places i don't know if it's just through agriculture and stuff but before we dive into the crazy details of what you do what's what's like the path for someone to get into managing land for whitetail like how did you get into this business this field because it's not like everybody kind of does it their own like half-assed way at home and when they try to do it but like it's a real big industry like managing for whitetail so how did you get involved with that yeah, so uh, actually I had a little bit of a unique path I would consider. Uh, back in August of 2022, my at the time fiance and I were getting ready to get married and uh, we decided to sell our house. We lived up in uh, northern Michigan, so we sold our house and moved down to the Ohio area. Uh, she, it, she works as a nurse and... Okay. I have always been really passionate about whitetails. Uh, I helped on like family properties and friends' properties up where we lived. Uh, it was just something I always really enjoyed doing and then just always seemed to find myself spending time out in the field, uh, whether it was in the off season or during season. And uh, when we moved down here, I knew there was a lot better culture around like the like a richer hunting tradition as far as going after trophy and caliber whitetail and i really wanted to make a go at it and i was actually going to just kind of like go out on my own and do my thing and see what i could make happen and i actually got connected with uh, sam billhorn who is the founder of whitetail partners i just sent him a random dm on instagram telling him what i was looking to do and uh, he got back with me and was telling me about how this consulting season, he was looking to expand his operations a little bit. And it uh, led to another conversation. And uh, I was able to be 
lucky enough to join his team as well as some other uh, guys across the country. And uh, just it's like one of those things where things just kind of fell into place. It was the right place, right time. And I sent the right guy, the right message. <laughs> the right day. You know, it's just all the, all the stars seemed to align for me. And I just tried to take full advantage of it and just started running with it. I don't know about you, but I always carry a knife. It doesn't matter what the situation is, I'm always reaching for a blade. Whether I'm out hunting in the backwoods, fishing on lakes and rivers, or simply cutting rope at camp, and when I need a tool, I want something that's quality, durable, and handmade right here in the USA. I know that's something you're looking for as well, so go to MaloneKnives.com and get yourself something that's going to last and look damn good too. Isn't it awesome when that stuff works out? It's just like the best feeling, man. Yes, <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> so nice to know there's someone looking out for you, yeah. wherever wherever they are, however yeah. they're doing. It's nice to know. Absolutely. So when when you manage land for someone, say they call you up or message you, send you an email, and they're like, "Hey, I'm looking for X. You know, I'm looking for some of my property. I have a picture. Here's the coordinates." What's like? What's the process look like? You know, I see you guys have these crazy maps on your website, and you you know, it, you have all these different things highlighted. So, what's your like? What's your progress of working with a customer to start that management process? Yeah, so really, uh, this is going to be different when you go from one consultant to the next. But like for myself personally, I really like to have like an initial phone call with somebody where they share me the information, like you said, about their property. And usually when I'm on that phone call with them, uh, we'll just look over the property and I'll kind of start picking it apart that way. Just kind of point out some things that stick out to me and then just get like a general idea of their goals, uh, what type of hunting they do. You know, some guys are more bow hunting dependent. Some guys do a full season, so on and so forth. So I really like to just get to understand the property itself and then what the landowner is trying to get from it. And then from there, we kind of decide what route is best. You know, are we wanting to do that on-site consultation where I'm coming out to the property and walking around and then drawing up those full plans? Or does it make more sense to go a little bit lower scale? And maybe it's just a guy that's looking for some information on how can I see more deer on my property, identifying different tree and plant species, things like that. So it's really not that one size fits all answer. It's just more so trying to figure out what exactly that landowner is looking for and then helping them out from there. So say I'm I'm a deer. I'm just kind of cruising around Ohio and I'm just like, hey, I'm looking for a nice plot of land to settle down, have a deer family. What I mean, what are deer looking for, man? I mean, I know it's a pretty in theory, it sounds very simple because we all know what deer are looking for. They like acorns, they like, you know, easy access to food, they like cover. But what what's like I guess what I'm asking is what's holding a deer in, say, my neighbor's property? And not mine. You know, like what's the big differences there? Yeah, so that's going to uh, vary depending on where you're at. But the best way, like how I always look at it whenever I am trying to break down something is what is the property lacking? Uh, So just like for a real world example, I'm getting ready to head out to a property in the next couple of weeks where after talking with the landowner, he told me that it's a reclaimed dairy farm. And there's no food. It used to have a lot of food because half of the property is made up of ag fields, but those are now reclaimed and they're just overgrowth vegetation. So that is turning into great bedding, but there's a lack of food, which on each side of this property, he mentioned there's food plots about a mile in each direction. So the thing that's stopping a deer from living and staying on his property is that lack of food. They have okay. nice security cover, but they have to leave to go and eat. So really they need that security cover and they need the food and they're going to leave to go and find what they need. But if they are able to have everything in one place, they don't think like us where we have these goals of like, I want to buy this bigger house. I want to live up on this hillside. You know, they don't think like that. They just know that I'm safe here. I can eat there and nobody's bothering me. So 
you just really have to make it extremely simple and then you can really figure out what it is that makes them tick. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that I see around where I'm at too, is, is with food specifically, we've tried different things like it, after the fact that seems really dumb to attempt something like putting corn feeders on a piece of land that's surrounded by corn on all sides. But when you're yeah. like, I'm, I'm relatively new to hunting, you know, I can't st- say that for too much longer cause I'm going on like six, seven years now, but it's, mm-hmm. but it's funny because you like, you see all this stuff. And then after the fact you think about it, like, why didn't this work? And it's like, they have thousands of acres of corn surrounding in yeah. all directions that is not an attractant to them in any way, shape or form, maybe in late, late season or whatever. Right. So, so does having more of the natural food that they would naturally eat, quote unquote, does that have any effect on a deer or is to them, is it just food is food and they really could care less? Yeah. So that natural food, uh, like that browsy type material, all of that stuff does play quite a significant role in where they're going to kind of like plant their roots per se. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't remember. I know I just read an article on how much they actually eat of browse. It's like a ridiculous amount, but that's just like one of the things that I started to really pay attention to and observe like in the field while I'm out there during hunting season. Like I try to just take those as good opportunities to just really watch deer and understand why they're why they're doing the things they're doing and with doing that i really started to realize just how much they actually browse you know when you're hunting deer especially so because i do a lot of my hunting on uh, public land Mm -hmm. uh, just because there's just so much of it and it's always a new adventure anywhere i go um but when you're just watching deer and you don't really have that destination set up for them and they're just kind of naturally working through the landscape what it does is like you see them and they're just like always eating. They're just like head level. They're just nibbling on any little green piece, any kind of buds. They're on the ground picking up any kind of leaves and they're doing that their whole way to wherever it is that they're going. Mm-hmm. So that natural food does play a really big role. It's nice to have that primary food, but that natural type stuff is also just as, or if not even more important. And it's funny because I read a book. It's I actually have it right here. Uh, it's one of those ones that just pops up on Amazon, Whitetail Savvy, something like that. Yeah, and that's really. where I learned most of my information about deer hunting when I first got started. Because when you start hunting with somebody, they just tell you what they know. And usually it's just misguided information and they just are winging it most of the time, <laughs> especially yeah. when it's newer hunters. So I, I wanted to dig into the research. And that was funny because browse, I was reading about that and it's wild. They pretty much just eat anything that, that exists yeah. out there. And the property that I hunt right outside where I'm sitting right now, I just walk across the field and I'm right there. And it's funny if you do look at the edge of the woods, pretty much everything deer height and below is eating. Yep. It, there's just yep. this ring around the woods and it's funny because you don't notice that until you read about it or learn about it from somebody mm-hmm. and, and you walk through the woods and there's nothing really at height of a deer's head that they can reach that's that's there even with all that food around so yeah it, it is interesting when you observe how much time do you spend in the field observing deer is it like an obsession for you uh yeah you could that would that's what my wife likes to say anyway. <laughs> it's, a, it's a full-on obsession yeah. uh no, yeah, for me, man, honestly, I don't I don't really have many other hobbies that aren't related to deer hunting. That's what led me to doing what it is that I am with mm-hmm. the consulting, but just outside of that, even just year-round type stuff, like I'm getting ready right now. Uh, I've been trying to train my dog up so her and I can go do some serious shed hunting, and cool. I like to use like the off-season as that shed hunting is just a bonus because you get to find those cool little trophies out there, but that just gives me opportunities to just go out and walk around. And like, I like to go like right into bedding areas on public land. And then just like, I can fully dissect them. Like I can like physically sit in the bed if I want to and look around and like wind map it. I can get a visual and I just like, I'll just take notes and just really figure out, okay, why are these deer doing what they're doing? And that's the thing is like, it's always consistent to some point, whether it's a wind based bed or a visual based bed, like they all have consistencies that you can use when you're creating these projects on private land. So 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm out there all the time. As you can see there, I, I started to get off on a tangent. I could have just went on about my daily activities all day long because, yeah, I, I do it quite a bit. I love that, <laughs> man. Love that's, that. that's what it takes, too. I mean, a lot of people want that easy, you know, sit during gun week and get that easy, and everybody has the dreams of that massive buck. And, like, everybody I've ever seen and known met personally that gets monster bucks puts in more time than you could even imagine so yeah it's a lot of work yeah i can attest to that i mean like uh this year is a perfect example i mean i think i've i've went out and hunted somewhere between 50 and 60 days like almost like full day sits this year during hunting season Mm -hmm. and i mean granted i did see some some nice deer that in years past i would have taken but i had just a little bit higher goal for myself this year and i had sightings of those great nice mature bucks but just never closed the deal on them and it's like you can literally spend a full season just absolutely grinding it out and then at the end of it you don't have that grip and grin photo to share with anybody which is like other people see that as a failure but to me it's just like I was able to spend all of these different months out in the woods learning how deer interact with the landscape in all these different phases of the season. And I don't look at success and failure as that grip and grin photo. Granted, it's nice. I love it. But at the same time, it's just like the joy of being out there, really. Yeah. And it's, it is such a different mindset too, because I came from the background of, you know, I, I like, I've always enjoyed wildlife. I've loved wildlife. And then when you get in more into the consumptive side of things, it really changes your perspective because it, it, you don't think about it the same way when you're just watching animal for the sake of watching an animal, like wildlife photography. I love it. I'll take a picture of a deer any day and I, I enjoy that. But until you under, like, I think adding that element of hunting changes the way you think about it because you need to know that animal you need to be in the mind of that animal and that's a whole different level of understanding than just being like i like deer they're fun to look at and i really enjoy them it just takes it to that that obsessive level i think and i think only a hunter can understand that really yeah and then it's like uh because there's and then even within that there's so many sub levels i guess you could say where you really start to understand why deer are doing what they're doing and then if you make that decision to go down the rabbit hole of going after these uh old weary mature bucks then it's like that's a whole nother ball game in itself because they just operate on different standards than the rest Mm -hmm. of the deer herd and they're always that one further step ahead than all the other deer once you really do start to understand them. And it just makes it that much more of a challenge and that much more of uh, just just that constant grind trying to figure them out. So I know that mature bucks are considered different in different parts of the country. So I know you, you've you hunted a lot up in Michigan. You have a lot of experience up in Michigan, and you've been on other podcasts talking about this. But what's what's the difference between a mature buck, say, in southern Ohio versus northern Michigan? I, they're just two different things, really. Yeah, definitely. So uh, a real good example is like this deer that I have on the wall behind me. So I shot him up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And that was actually the day before Michigan's rifle season. So it was the last day of bow hunting up there, which is like right about the time that the rut really starts picking up. Mm -hmm. And I got him, uh, he was just out chasing a doe. And that's when I got him. And I mean, this is a, just an old gnarly deer. He's got some broken tines and everything like that. And I never got him aged or anything, but like, he's got that short snout and you can just tell he's an old deer, but, and he might score like 120 inches, 125 on a good day. And that's one of the, you know, proudest things I've ever done out in the woods is getting him where a buck of that same age class down in Ohio has the potential to be in that 150 to 160 plus range. So it's really just those antler genetics is really a main key. As far as like how they operate using the landscape, I find a lot of similarities in that. You know, they the landscape itself is different, but how they are just kind of like these solitary loner type individuals those are usually the characteristics bucks have that make it to that older age class yeah i've i've only shot two bucks in my life and they're actually right behind me here 
Got my nice. hat hangers back there. And Sweet. I've been told they're both are in like the four year old age range, which yeah, you know, I don't, awesome. I, and which is cool. I mean, I'm not going to say that it was all of like great planning on my end. It's just what yeah. happened to be around and it was during the rut. So it was like these big boys are coming out and claiming their territory oh, yeah. and stuff around these small guys. And I'm very proud of them. You know, of course, you know, we all have that dream of kidding that just like dream monster yeah. deer. Uh, do you think, do you think people sometimes get too obsessed with that? Or do you think that's a good thing? Because, you know, I personally, as a newer, newer hunter, I appreciate deer as a food source for me but i know at some point it becomes more of a okay i'm like getting better at this and i really want to get something that's like for conservation reasons older more mature and not you know wiping out younger deer in the population but also as just a more intense challenge because it's it's hard as it is and that mature trophy size massive buck is like the is like expert level chess versus like playing at an entry level you know yeah, definitely. So that's that's where it's like so the tricky thing about this, like when you start getting into passing up like quality deer to wait for that really bigger deer. There's so many different ways that you can look at it. I always feel like, because that's kind of how I, like that's the stage of my hunting journey that I'm at now that I'm fully confident in my ability to just be able to go out and harvest a deer right at the beginning of the season if I want to, but it's not that challenge for me. And that's what I like to, like, I like to utilize my buck tags as a challenge where I go out there and I try to play that expert level chess game and win at it. So I feel like as long as you understand going into it, that you're about to dedicate potentially a large amount of time over the course of the next four to five months and really just get into like this mental grind, then that's, that's fine. But that's the thing I feel like people, a lot of people don't realize with how popular, like uh, going on out of state public land hunting trips is becoming on YouTube and everything like that. Those guys that are putting out those YouTube videos are a great example because you get to see this little 10 minute clip of them going out on public land harvesting this mature whitetail. But what they don't have videos of is how much time did they spend e scouting, boots on the ground scouting, how many hunts did they have where they didn't see anything. So you don't get to see the full picture, and it's not nine times out of 10 when you're talking about mature whitetail, it's not that instant gratification, you know, like you got to put in a lot of time and relating that to the private land side of things. That's where these habitat plans and these designs come into play is when you're optimizing your habitat, you make your property more desirable for these mature whitetail and you have all the control over the pressure. So it makes it, a lot more attainable to consistently get those mature whitetail. So when it comes to management for whitetail specifically, most of what I see on YouTube focuses around food plot, food plot, food plot. That's all people talk about, which, you know, is probably if from anything I've understood is probably the most affordable way to go about this. So what does, what does a food plot entail? I know that's a that's kind of like a, a loaded question because there's so many options for it. But when someone says I'm putting in a food plot, what what does that mean to you? And how does how do you guys help out with that process? Yeah, so uh, that really comes down to the individual property itself. <clears throat> Excuse me, and whether or not you know, there's like you said, it's a loaded question. There's a lot of different layers of food plots. You know. Um, and you can get into specifics about it, but really what a, what a food plot usually is, is like that primary food source that allows deer, if you have enough land, it allows deer to live on your property and use that as their primary source of food throughout whatever part of the year based off of what you plan exactly. But just because you're planning that food plot, you know, that's just one piece of the puzzle. Even if it is the most important piece, the one that makes the picture look pretty, it's everything else that's around that food plot that leads to the success. Um, so you very rarely are going to have 
opportunities to shoot these older age class deer right off of the edge or in the middle of a food plot. You know, it's going to happen if you have the right setup, the right access, things like that. But you're going to have a lot better opportunities if you are finding those habitat features in or around the food plot that's going to allow you to narrow down that movement and kind of like key in on how the deer are accessing to it. And that's where you can lead little travel corridors, things like that. You find the food, you find the bed, you work in between them. And that's how you use food plots. So that's like what I like to, how I like to look at it. The food plot's just another tool in the belt that allows you to find those best setups for the property. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that for for the outside perspective of a non-hunter, anti-hunter sort of person, they would probably look at managing a piece of property for whitetail as quote unquote cheating. I personally don't see it that way because it's land management essentially, which is what every single park, state park, national park, like it's all land management. You're just doing it on private property. And I think there's this weird weird way of looking at things as soon as it deals with private property people are like that's not fair but yeah that's what that's what all all state and national and federal property is also under land management too maybe not to that extent but that's what they're doing they're they're making the land more habitable to wildlife species and just because you're managing for deer doesn't mean you're not also helping all other wildlife species associated because it's all part of the same ecosystem, you know? So what would you, what's your response to that? Say as like the devil's advocate side of this is cheating for deer hunting. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, like you said, all of these other like state agencies, federal agencies, they're managing and optimally setting up these, their pieces of land. It's really no different from a landowner's perspective. And, you know, the thing about it is, is that the people that own these large pieces of land, they have worked really hard in their lives to be able to own something like that. And they have that right to do what they choose to do with their land. And it's also, like you said, a collateral effect that when you are improving the habitat for whitetail, collaterally, you are improving it for all these other wildlife species as well. So, there really isn't any negativity to it. And from my viewpoint, just because you're just making the whole ecosystem better. And if enough people are out there improving their lands, then that's also going to make the public type lands that people can go out and hunt that don't have the opportunity to own property. That's going to eventually make those better too, because it's just going to be that chain reaction where if every piece of land in this one specific county is optimally designed for good wildlife habitat. Well, that state land that's right in the middle, those deer are going to pass through all of those chunks of property as well. And that that's going to make that state land better, you know? So I, I just have a hard time looking at it and from any kind of negative light, because there is so much good that comes out of it from a full spectrum. Yeah. I mean, how could it be a bad thing to manage property for wildlife in general because it's no secret no surprise that public lands just are getting smaller exponentially every year it's not like they're getting bigger and Mm -hmm. i think that's kind of forcing the hand of landowners to kind of do these kind of things and it's helping everyone i mean if there's like deer are deer turkey whatever animal that is hunted that's a public resource That is a public resource, and it's not just because someone manages their land for deer. That's not their deer. They don't own the deer herd. It is still a public resource. So, like, helping all these different animals thrive with your own money, that's like a—you're, like, basically giving back to the public— Un- exactly. even unwillingly sometimes not even knowing right. it but it's awesome and I, I think that's why I'm so behind this I mean there, it's also no secret that I mean it is not like a cheap endeavor you have to have money to buy property and to right. you know consult with you guys but I think even the average person could honestly do it with a little research I mean you you came into this without with doing your own research I'm assuming you didn't yeah. just take a class on land management or something and you're all of a sudden you're working so you know what advice do you have for people you know that maybe want to do it on their own what like what do you what would you suggest what course would you take because it's just not 
it's not affordable for everyone, but mm-hmm. it, it is affordable for some, you know? Yeah. So, uh, the nice thing, uh, before I kind of go into that a little bit, mm-hmm. like you said, it is the huge investment to be able to own a nice quality piece of land, all of the equipment that goes into upkeeping that piece of land. But it, the, the cheapest investment and probably the greatest ROI that you're going to see would be from the consulting that you're going to get on that property. You know, in terms of what everything else you're putting into the property costs, having that professional plan drawn up for your land is going to be by far your best ROI out there. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's up, everyone? James Appleton here, co-founder of Absolute Aid. Welcome to the Seek to Do More program. This program will help you help yourself by developing the daily habits that will elevate your entire life. Over the next 30 days, you'll complete the doer's list every single day. And the doer's list includes one, do something physical. Two, follow and stick to your diet of choice. Three, read a real book. Four, further your education on purpose. Five, dedicate time to your spiritual life. And six, dedicate time to your hobbies. So if you're ready to take a structured, proven approach to build the daily habits that will allow you to get the most out of yourself, your time, and your life every single day, the Seek to Do More program is your blueprint. So make a choice, commit to yourself, sign up below, and let's get started. Well, how could like the average, say th- there's a guy that o- that has some family property that he doesn't own, but they're like, yeah, you can do whatever you want with it. But he yeah. doesn't have like, say 20, 30, $40,000 to go go the route of buying land or, or $100,000 or whatever. And then he's just like, I kind of just want to do what I can to make it a little more attractive to deer just for me and my family to hunt there. You know, maybe yeah. they'll inherit it someday. You know? Okay. Yep. So... Uh, a good place to start for this guy like that. So it would be like for myself, I just tried to consume content any way that I could. Um, I like to read. So I read a lot of books on just uh, deer biology, uh, how deer use, use the landscape, really just anything I could get my hands on. Uh, YouTube is a great source of knowledge now. That's the nice thing about the the internet is that it's literally just this wealth of knowledge at your fingertips. And if you know how to use it, you can find great info. Uh, so another thing that like what we are doing, we try to deliver learning content for visitors to our website, to yeah. our social yeah. media pages, things like that. And honestly, like, I know from my from my own perspective, I'm more than happy just to offer up any kind of like quick tips, things like that. That's why I try to share all the things I do on my social media is just to help people out. And then really just uh, going out there and trying it. You know, if, if somebody ha- puts them or is in that type of position where they have a little bit of land to work with, you know, just go out there after you learn a little bit, try a project out for a year and just make sure to track it. It's no different than any other kind of goal that you set for yourself in any phase of your life. You know, if it's a physical goal, you're going to start working out. And then in five months, you're going to look and say, okay, how long have I, how far along have I Mm -hmm. came for your property? You implement this bedding area, say, and then after the hunting season, you go back into that bedding area and you determine, okay, did the deer use it? And then you ask yourself why or why not? And you just if you always ask yourself why you can find out a lot, uh, it's just like that endless rabbit hole of what is actually going on. And it, you can answer questions very easily. You know, if you have that bedding area and deer aren't using it, well, there's a reason why, because the bedding area looks nice, but are they able to get inside of it? Oh, there was a tree that fell in the entry exit trail that I cut for this bedding area. There's your answer. So, it's like, just go out there and do it. You know, you can take in as much content and knowledge as you want, but if you're not willing to just go out and try it, you're never going to actually know what results come from it. I'm glad you said that because I say that all the time on this podcast is like, I, I, I'm, I'm the same way. You can read all you want, but if you don't go out and do the thing, it doesn't matter. You're just like, you have all this knowledge in your brain and it's like, well, if you don't grab the chainsaw and go after it, well then it's just sitting there in your brain useless. And you know, I think I I always push that perspective because I think a lot of times, not that the shows that you talked about on YouTube are a bad thing. I think they're awesome for learning and stuff, but if people get really discouraged because they go out on public land and they're like, yeah, I watched, you know, 
five seasons of the hunting public and then they go out there and they're like i saw zero deer it's like well <laughs> watching the hunting public is a that's a te- that's a television show essentially those dudes have spent probably the majority of their life figuring this stuff out they have hard-earned knowledge you're not just going to go buy a saddle and all of a sudden you're going to be like a world-class bow hunter this is not right. how it works. yeah <laughs> yeah when uh you know like when you when you listen to the uh like the success specific podcast of these just like legendary public land whitetail hunters. It's like they have these stories that they can tell from the last 20 to 30 years of all the knowledge. And so it's just like, think about that in the terms of what you gain from one season compared to what you're going to gain over 30 seasons. So, and that's like really where, my eyes opened up in the whitetail world was once I realized that there's only so many tactics I can learn before my glass is full. And then that glass is going to start overflowing. Eventually I have to start developing like my own principles of like, what's my approach going into the woods? Uh, No different than like on a property, you know, it's like, what is the approach that's going to lead to these tactics being successful? And that's like, that's been my biggest thing is you just have to look past that tactic based stuff and really look into the core of how to be successful. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it too, because it's, it's a matter of time in effort in and like that compounds over time to be better. It's essentially you're giving yourself a PhD in deer. That's what you're doing over a lifetime. And even people who have been doing this stuff for 20, 30, 40 years, they're still learning every day. I mean, wildlife are not static objects. They're not a video game. They're not there for you to be successful. They do not want to get killed. That is like the last thing that they want, just like any other living creature. So it is a very difficult challenge. I think, especially when you get to a level like you're at, you really, it becomes more of a, it's not even a hobby anymore. It's like, that's what you do. That's what you are mm-hmm. is a someone as who hunts. And that's your thing. A lot of people have right. other things. Like I'm assuming you probably don't spend a lot of your free time playing video games and stuff. You're probably doing deer related things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Typically. And that's, that's like how I approach it is I set my identity for like, this is the person that I want to be. And then those inputs that you put in like I base my my inputs are what I want my identity to be so like if I want to be a great habitat manager and an elite whitetail hunter then it's like well I know what's at the end of the line so what do I do every single day to get that and it's not going and playing call of duty for seven hours it's e-scouting going out walking around the woods uh working with clients on their property You just got to go out there and do the things that align with who you want to become as a person. That's how I've always looked at it. Yeah. And I I see a lot of the people who, who travel around the country to hunt and stuff. And I really like that. I mean, I travel too to hunt. I love to hunt. I go to Texas every year and I love hunting. Um, I'm lucky enough to have friends down there that have leases. And there's a conference I go to down there. That's really awesome where it's kind of like, it's it's pay to play you're on a ranch and stuff but it's affordable because there's a lot of people going for the average person but i i really have dedicated my time to learning to hunt where i live because it's i live here you know it's like yeah. it's it's a challenging spot for me personally and that just makes it all the better for me and that's why i am getting down this this route of maybe i should learn a little bit about land management because the scenario i talked about earlier with the guy who has family land who can't afford to buy his own that's me and i'm trying right. just figuring this stuff out and and I feel like that's the place that a lot of people I know are in. And it's, it's all, it's all again, time in effort in, and you will be successful over time. And just cause you don't have an ideal property, that's something you can change. That's something you can control. You still can hunt public land. I have plenty of public land around here that I can hunt, but it, you know, it's a, it's a matter of me being lazy and I have a place that's like right. quote unquote mine to do what I want with. So why wouldn't I work to like make my own little slice of something that I have control over rather than public land, which is still a great option. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, like you were saying there about just being able to improve that, improve your own property. It really just starts with 
the doing. You know, we've covered it a few times now. You just got to like go out there and set that plan up and start making it happen because it's not a short term play. It's not like you're going to go out there and cut a betting area today and shoot 180 inch buck tomorrow. <laughs> you know, like, it's no different. It's, it's all about a process. So whether you are going out there to do this by yourself or you are going to hire a consultant to come on and help you make that plan, it really just, it, the fact of the matter is you just have to get going on it. And once you do get started, everything's going to start to make so much more sense and you're going to realize that, okay, this plan that we started with two, three years down the road, it's working, but what can I do to make it a little bit better? Or maybe my goals have changed. Maybe when we drew up this plan, I just wanted to see deer on my property, but now I've seen deer for the last three years. Now I'm ready to start trophy hunting. Do I need to make adjustments to this plan? So that's the other thing is like, it, you can't get blinded by getting expert advice on something and saying, Oh, here's my plan. I'm done now because that's not where it ends. You know, that's really just where it begins. Now you just have that guided input of how to improve things in the right direction. And it, one of the things that, you know, I know you have some experience with hunting in different States since you lived in Michigan and now you live in Ohio. Um, I don't think you can talk about them at the same level because Michigan just has a different ball game of like, A, they manage differently. They do have different regulations for deer and stuff. They have so much, like, we're, we're literally touching, the states are touching, but they're just drastically different in how they operate. And Michigan also has this added um, complication of the whole like federal wolf thing and people get real sketched out talking about that but does that do you really like as a person who lived there who's hunted in the upper peninsula do you think that that is affecting deer populations in any significant way especially in the up because it's not really a southern michigan problem it's yeah. really a, a northern michigan issue yeah um no, I mean, that could be a whole another whole another episode we could go into talking about wolves. Uh, so yeah, the where I hunt in the Upper Peninsula is right in the middle of the Hiawatha National Forest. It's right in between Manistee and Munistine, so it's like dead center, and it's just just endless acres of federal forest. And we are positioned like right in the we're like it's like hill area and it's where the deer start their migrating so we're not on any kind of like major migrating trails but all the deer from around kind of work through our area to get to those migrating trails so we have a lot of food we have these big beech ridges some acorn ridges everything like that and i've been hunting up there for 12 years now and it, it's been like this big wave where everything, when I first started hunting, there wasn't really a ton of deer there. And this was before the wolves were an issue. And it was from the low deer numbers were from like uh, a bad stretch of winters one after another. And then the winters weren't so bad and the population started to go up. And then all of a sudden you started hearing more about these wolves and then the deer, some, the deer sightings started to go down more. And that was about the same time that I really started to take hunting more seriously. And like, instead of going out to a party on the weekend, like I was going up to deer camp in the UP and I was going to go bow hunt for the weekend. So I was spending a lot more time out in the woods at that point too. And just from my personal perspective, like I was physically seeing wolves while I was bow hunting. Like I have videos in my library on my phone of just having wolves packs running past your tree stand uh so like it just it's not a huge deal to me because like i understand that's just part of the natural ecosystem up there mm -hmm. but i think you'd have to be blind to not acknowledge that they do have a negative impact without being regulated that's where i see the issue is is that if they're not going to be regulated, then they're just going to go out and do whatever they want because they don't have any fear of anything. They don't have any reason to, and they're just, you know, they're natural born killers. So they're just going to go out there and do their thing. And it's, I don't have a bad place in my heart full of wolves because they're just an animal doing what they were born and what their genetics tell them to do. But 
it's hard to say also that there shouldn't be something done to at least keep the population in check. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not any kind of biologist or anything that has any kind of say in what the population is or how you control it. And I know there's so many different layers to that, but it definitely does have a negative impact on the, on the deer population in my area, just from the, my personal experience. Well, something I've learned, you know, with a podcast focused on conservation issues and, you know, some of the touchy subjects that we all fall into just in that world. I mean, hunting is very political and very conservation world is very political. And, you know, I don't you don't have to be a biologist to understand this stuff, man. I mean, you literally said you have videos watching wolves and you have 12 years of experience up there watching populations go up and down pre and post wolf issue things. So, I mean, that's why it's important, I think, for people like you and me and who are out there doing this stuff all the time. It is important to be involved in like, you don't have to have a PhD in biology to under like to, to go to a conservation meeting or like join an advocacy group and be like, yo, this is messed up. Like, I just want deer and I want a healthy ecosystem. So it's, mm-hmm. it, it is it is doable for the average person. It's just overwhelming especially when you're spending so much time doing what you love which is hunting you know Mm -hmm. and it it is it is whatever a a difficult thing for a lot of us because you're also like i don't have time to just go sit in meetings and stuff but at some point you know i think we all end up at that place like i I need to start doing something about this i put in the time to like be good at this and now the the issues surrounding wildlife start mattering more on like a personal level yeah absolutely do you are you involved in any sort of conservation organizations, any sort of, you know, groups like that? Because I just started within the last year, year and a half, getting more involved in those kind of groups like Ducks Unlimited, MUCC, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So nothing specifically. Uh, now that I am spending so much time <clears throat> in the whitetail space professionally, I'm starting to look at different uh, conservation groups and everything that I can start to become a part of. Because like you said, you get to that point when, one, I spend so much time on the personal side of things, but I'm also building my livelihood around the well-being of mm-hmm. them. So it's it would almost be ignorant for me not to want to put the best foot forward. And I always look at it from the standpoint of, you know, I'm only going to have so much time where I can hunt deer, where I can manage properties for deer, but I have the ability to stamp a set of regulations or at least be a part of it that is going to allow future generations to enjoy this stuff the same way that I've enjoyed it because hunting is such a main topic that gets attacked politically so often that if us as outdoorsmen don't take that step to try to protect it, like it's going to be taken away. And it's, you know, you have to think long-term if you want those future generations, because I want to be 85 years old one day with my 18 year old grandson coming up to me like, Hey grandpa, me and my buddies are going on this hunting trip. Yada, yada, you know, like that's cool because I can think back to all my earlier days of, uh, I remember when my friends and I used to just hop in a car, drive 14 hours and go hunt bucks on public land, you know, like that was fun. And I still want people to be able to do that in 60 years because that's cool stuff, but you have to be willing to think with a long time horizon if you want that stuff to keep happening. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So yeah, it's, it is, it is really important to me, you know, the more I dive down this rabbit hole to get involved in that, but we'll switch topics here. I, I, I'm not a big gear guy. I'm like a very functional person. I just like to get the job done. I like to have stuff obviously that works, obviously that I can rely on, but I'm not like a nuts and bolts, like obsessing over stuff. And I feel like that's a lot of what I see on social media nowadays. It's like dudes obsessing over like tuning their bow every time they hunt and stuff, which is important. You have to like have a, a, a functioning weapon of choice you don't just want some piece of shit that's not gonna work (laughs) but when when you as a hunter do you i mean how do you feel on that topic i mean obviously i have my own opinions on things but do you is is it important to you i just see so much online is just like pushing name brands and trying to look cool as shit rather than just going out and being like obsessing over deer hunting 
Yeah, I'm I'm more so of the latter there, just obsessing over deer hunting. I've never really been a gear junkie. Same kind of thing for me. Like I like to just use the stuff that works, and I look at like. If it's not causing me any issues, then I'm not going to go out there and spend an extra few hundred dollars just because it's got this logo on it. Um, And I like, honestly, like a lot of the stuff uh, just for like, uh, like the little like knickknacks that you have when you're taking everything out in the woods or how you're tying things together. Like I feel that I've developed my own hunting style that it's so hard for these big businesses to break down how all these people are hunting. And I like to just like customize a lot of my stuff anyway. And uh, like, I don't, I don't get big into a lot of like the camo and everything like that. Like I feel that you can get around that by just understanding the wind and thermals and approaching the woods the right way. And it's from the gear standpoint, same kind of thing. Like if it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and there are there is a time and a place for it. And like the one thing that I do like to have just because my main go to is bow hunting. So like I went out and I got a super nice bow set up because mm-hmm. I want that thing to be able to operate whenever it's the moment of truth. You know, that comes with me practicing and shooting in my spare time whenever I have it. But I want to make sure that that thing's fully operational. But I feel like everything outside of that is just a luxury because sometimes when I'm out hunting public land, you know, I can find myself, I don't even climb trees. I'll just tuck behind a bush. So I'm not going to spend all this money and input on these setups if I'm not even going to use it 30% of the time. Yeah. I've heard yeah, it said it's, in it's, the past it's, that, you know, people, when they obsess over gear like that, it's just to cover up how much they don't know about what they're doing. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. It's just right, funny when yeah. you think about that. Cause all my money's spent on books and traveling and sitting out in the field. It's like, I have a nice bow. I love bow hunting. It's, I would say it's also my favorite. I, you know, I, I'm not opposed to any type of hunting. I, I'll sit out there during gun week too. I'll sit out there mm-hmm. for muzzle loader, but I, I just prefer to have a bow in my hand. It's what I'm, I'm more comfortable with a bow to be completely honest than I am with a gun. It's just, I practice more with a bow. It's more accessible for me to walk outside my house and shoot at 30, 20, 40 yards yeah. every day or a couple times a week than it is to drive and join a range or set up my gun. And then you have to clean your gun. And like every time it's like, I just like doing a bow. It's much more simple. It's much more intimate, I guess too. It's, I just feel yeah. more, more in tune with the bow, but do you, I, on the flip side of that, I am not, I don't enjoy sitting in a tree stand at all. Like I really do not like it. I will do it. Obviously it's part of hunting, especially here in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just bow hunting with a tree stand. And I'm like, I'm like you in the sense is I like to tinker. I like to create my own stuff. And I saw this, this saddle trend going around and I was a little hesitant at first. I'm like, how is this different than a climber? You know, it seems like a lot more complicated. And then I saw the price of saddles and I was like, dear Lord, dude, this is a, this is an right. investment. So I kind of did my own research. I, I built my own for like way less money and I feel hundred percent safe in it. I'm a big dude. I'm like six, mm-hmm. one, like 245 on a good day. Yeah. And I was very nervous about hanging from a little tiny rope. And I've, I'm also a person who has a hard time sitting still. If you mm-hmm. haven't noticed this whole podcast, I'm just right, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the saddle for me, although I feel like it's a little bit more of a pain to set up, I feel so much more comfortable in the tree because it's so much easier to see around me. And I don't know if you've had any experience with it. I know it's like a trendy new thing right now, but it's like one of the trends that I've actually agreed with this whole time because I feel like I have such a bigger range, especially for bow hunting, where I can just see everything, which to me is so much more important than Mm -hmm. any other option because how many times have you sat in a tree stand and just your neck hurts from just turning and looking behind you slowly all day? I don't get that in the saddle. I can just like slowly swing around the side of the tree very delicately. So I don't know. I'm just curious to have have a professional person's opinions on that because I personally love it. I just, I didn't think I'd like it and I'm obsessed with it. It's like all I hunt out of now. Yeah, I think really it just, it comes down to uh, where you're hunting, uh, what, what is right and what type of hunting you're doing. It's like 
another thing where there's so many different variables, but uh, myself personally, I'm not actually a huge fan of saddle hunting and not from a functionality standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think that they are great. uh, But so I have had uh, three knee surgeries on my right knee from my baseball playing days. Mm -hmm. And I have a really hard time using saddles because when I'm in that like leaning back motion and kind of putting all that weight on my knee like that, if I'm trying to go out there for an extended period of time, it's just, it doesn't work. Like, unfortunately my knee just won't agree with it, especially in like the colder weather. Mm -hmm. So that's like kind of a good example where that type of gear is absolutely optimal and perfect for somebody like yourself. And you can see all these benefits to it, but I just simply can't use it just because my body tells me no. And that doesn't make me not want to hunt, you know, it's just like, I got to find something that does work for me. So I, I still use saddles every now and again, if I know I'm just going out on like a quick hunt or something like that, or if I'm hunting in an area that I need a little bit slicker access, that kind of thing. But for myself personally, I do, I do a lot of just like the uh, mobile hang on stuff in and out type of thing from one spot to the next day after day. Is how I'm usually running. I mean, I say that's what the majority of people do too. I just, I don't know. I never have felt comfortable in like a climber either. I the the deer that I did successfully take with a bow was from a climber, and it was just because my buddy left it out there, and it was easy to move instead of like trying to haul a tree stand around. And mm-hmm. I just never, I've been up and down in them a million times. It's just I never feel comfortable in them because yeah. I always feel like I'm on the verge of slipping down the tree, and I just. I hunt by myself a lot too. And I just feel like if I get into that scenario, I would be stuck there for a long time and I'll just be be very, very, very uncomfortable. I mean, if you're doing everything properly with safety stuff, I feel like that's really a non issue, but it's still just a pain. Like if the thing slides out from under you and a rope, like a, one of the little things that holds the the climbers together fails or something. I mean, you're, yeah, you're gonna definitely. be hanging for a while. Yeah, so. yeah. That's uh, so. Like, I started actually these last couple of years. I I do a lot more bow hunting from the ground. Uh, like, I never really even considered it to be an option. But that's like one of my things is when I'm doing a lot of this hill country hunting in these big state forests in the southeast part of the state. It's like, and that's some unforgiving terrain out there. And I don't want to find myself falling from a tree when I'm a mile, two miles back from my car and nobody knows where I am and I don't have any cell phone service. So it's like, you got to think logistically at some point. And that's the other nice thing though, about like, I can find setups in hill country that allow me to hunt from the ground. So I just try to like use whatever the land is giving me to go out and like determine. I try to not have any like preset notions going in because I feel like that's where a lot of my failures came in my early hunting days uh, was like being like, okay, I'm going to go to this point on my Onyx and I'm going to climb this tree and it's going to work. And it's like, well, no, it usually doesn't work. I found it a lot more beneficial to kind of read things as I go and allow that fresh, active, what is happening now, allow me to decide how I'm going to plan my setups. I actually enjoy I hunting from the ground more than I do hunting from any sort of tree. It's just I'm not that confident in myself to, yet to bow hunt from the ground because it's just it is a lot of movement and oh, yeah. I'm not that good at it. So it's yeah, just like I need to be <laughs> need to be more confident in that, I guess. But it is it is a lot of hunting's cool because it's a lot of different skill sets that you need to have. It's not just like 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 you played baseball for a long time. You don't just show up and practice like baseball like hunting is not like that. You don't show up to like I have X schedule I'm practicing every day. It's like you have to be an an expert with a weapon, which is similar to baseball and practicing in that route. But you also have to be an expert in understanding an animal. You almost have to be a biologist and then you have to understand how to read landscapes. It's just this massive undertaking. And I think you almost have to be psycho to like it. (laughs) Seriously though. That's, that's where it comes down to like that obsession standpoint. I had that moment of realization. I mean, man, I've been like all into this for a few years now. I'm like, I hit that moment where I was like, 
man, I really want to be good at this. But if I do, like, I, I understand that it's going to be different. Like where we, we grew up in Michigan, it's like everybody went out hunting on opening day rifle season, did all that kind of stuff and bow hunt a couple of times throughout the year. So it's like, there's always that hunting tradition, but then you started to like meet these guys that are just like straight up killers. And you're like, what are they doing that is making that happen? And then it's like, oh, they're just spending a lot of time doing it and they really enjoy it. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for it. And, you know, it's like one thing led to another and here I am. Uh, Cause I would have never expected five years ago, if I could go back and have a conversation with myself, be like, Hey dude, you're going to be living in Southern Ohio, working on private land and hunting bucks all over the state. Like, no way would I ever expect that, but you know, here I am. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's cool how life turns out that way. And I think that's, there's a book out there. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list. And it's basically the concept of the book is the difference between being uh, like a motivated amateur and a professional. And basically from what I've been told about the book is that the different, the main difference, the synopsis is the difference from going out and doing stuff every once in a while. Like, Oh, I might write an article for this magazine once a year. And like being a full-time writer is you sit down and write all the time. Like that's the same thing with hunting. The difference between becoming an amateur hunter, maybe getting a, a buck every couple of years or a doe every season between that and being a professional or very, very successful hunter is putting your ass in the, in the woods and hunting a lot. That's the difference yeah. between an amateur and professional. And like, you're a prime example of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just between that. And then really the other big thing is just like the confidence aspect. Um, I just, that's the other thing that I try to have, whether I am hunting during season for myself or going out on somebody's property and drawing up a plan. Like I just try to approach it like with this unwavering amount of confidence where I, I feel so good about what I'm doing that even if it doesn't work out, it's like, I don't look at it as failing anymore. I just look at it as like another stepping stone of learning how to become successful. You know, if I go out on a hunt where I'm just like, sure as shit, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to kill a buck and it doesn't happen. I am not failing. I'm just like, I'm learning how to make it happen. If we go out and we design this plan and things don't wind up the way that we intended them to, well, let's get back to the drawing board and let's figure out how we do it. So you just got to like have that confidence too and don't get beat down when things don't work out because you're playing a losing game with hunting, you know, like, you know, you're talking, if you go out in the Ohio season, you get one buck tag. And if you hunt, even if you just hunted 10 times a year, you're only successful once, you're going to be successful 10% of the time. You know, mm-hmm. if you're really starting to commit time to it, like a guy like me, I've been out 50, 60 times this year. I'm still at 0% and I'm not giving up. You know, I'm still going out there. I'm still doing my thing. Uh, but I have confidence. I have just as much confidence today with the week left in the season as I did that last weekend of September when I was out there. And that's really the big thing, too, is like that confidence and just believing that what you're doing is going to work. Yeah. And there's I mean, there's a lot of analogies to draw from pretty much any sort of practice, because I over the last few years, I've really like enjoyed getting into stuff like Olympic weightlifting and stuff. And you get really frustrated because it's very technical and it's very like, I mean, it's heavy and it sucks and it hurts and it's like whatever. And I really enjoy like my coaching because they're telling me because like you fail a lot, you fail often. And they're like, you get frustrated, especially when you're new, just like with hunting, you get frustrated and you want to quit because it's like, Oh, I just, I keep screwing this up. And they're like, you're not thinking about this, right, dude. It's like, if you are not screwing up and failing consistently lifts, it's like, you're not trying hard enough. Like if you see people around you and they never fail, it means they're not pushing their limits. And like, if you're not pushing your limits, it's not a failure. It's a learning process. Like how many times, like, we all went to school. We all went through grade school and we sometimes, you know, we all wanted to get A's or whatever. It's like, you want to, mm-hmm. you want to be good, but you, sometimes you didn't. Sometimes you study your ass off and you get a B and you're like, well, <laughs> this sucks. And it's like, well, you know, learn, learn. That's your learning process, man. It's, it's, it's all about, you know, you have to have that perspective of it's not always a failure. It's a, you're pushing your boundaries and you're like, you're learn you're pushing onto the edge where you don't know what you're doing yet. 
but yeah. you're only going to get there by pushing that edge consistently. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. One of, uh, one of the better books that I've read on like mindset was, I don't know if you ever read it. It's called the comfort crisis by Michael Easter. Yeah, That's like definitely. that. I read that like, uh, cause I didn't read much growing up and I got into reading a few years ago and I kind of started like reading like those, motivational self-help type books. And I came across that one when he first uh, published it. And that was like my eye opening moment. Like, wow, man, you, you really are just living like this cozy ass life. You just got like this easy street going job type thing, graduated from college. Like you can just put everything on cruise control for the next 20, 30 years Mm -hmm. or you can go out there and try to make something happen and do something crazy that people look at you and think you're just absolutely crazy. (laughs) And it's like, that seems way more fun. And little did I know at the time, it's like everything along the way, there are a lot of failures and a lot of people are like, dude, what are you doing with, you just got to go out there and do it and just get uncomfortable. And like you said, you got to fail and you got to look at failure. Like it's just a stepping stone to achieving what you want. Yeah. There's a, there's a book I recommend to you too. It's called uh, talent is overrated. If you haven't read that one, okay. it's basically the same principle. It's like, nobody's really good at anything. It's all about putting in a shitload of time and effort, which you already know. So maybe you don't need to read it, but that, that book transformed my thought process to probably like a decade ago. I was like, I'm only going to be good if I put in the effort. Nobody's coming to yep. like help me. It's all me. I have to figure this out. So that's a mindset that I live with too. But um, I just realized we've been talking for a long time. I don't want to keep yeah. you all day because th- this is my job. I could talk to you for four or five, six hours. So uh, we'll we'll wrap her up. Greg, dude, this has been a really awesome conversation. I, I learned a lot. I think my listeners learn a lot and you're like, you're just a cool dude, man. You, you really, you're really like masterful in what you do. Just, just the way you talk, the way you, you, you think about things. I love that mindset. Um, but before we wrap up, where can people learn more if they're if they're trying to get into management and with you guys specifically? I know White Nail White Tail Partners is all over, kind of. Like, where can they learn more? How can they get in contact with you, especially the state of Ohio that we both live in? If there's anybody looking to manage some property, you know, get get in touch with you because you know what you're talking about. Thanks, man. Uh, so yeah, there's a few ways that you can get a hold of me, or if you're just looking for general info. So uh, if you're just looking for some general info on land management, things like that. You can check out our website, which is just whitetailpartners.com. Uh, we're really starting to work on putting more like valuable learning content out there that is like not just like that canned little short videos and everything that you see other people putting out on YouTube. Like we're trying to put out like that high value stuff that people can truly learn from. Uh, so you can find like that type of content there. If you want to reach out to me specifically, uh, I try to stay super active on Instagram. I frequently post like, I'll do like these Onyx breakdowns where I just take little snippets of Onyx of either properties I'm working on or places I'm scouting and I just try to break them down that way. Uh, I do like just general habitat tips, just a little bit of everything. On Instagram, it's whitetail underscore partners underscore Ohio. Uh, my email is ohio at whitetailpartners.com. And if you have any kind of like specific questions outside of that, you'd like to dive into your property, just reach out to me through one of those areas. And then we can set up a time to chat on the phone and um, we'll, we'll get you all taken care of. Or if you just want to talk about deer and deer hunting, I'm always down to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Greg, thank you so much, dude. I, I, I love this podcast, man. This is one of the, the most fun episodes I've done in a minute. So thank you for your time, dude. 